So my name is Marty Dumas and I am an author and I mostly write books for children. I write uh, middle grade and chapter books and it may seem like, okay, well, I don't write middle grade or chapter books. And so then those books are going to be easier or different. The thing is, that's like super, super cool is that stories are stories mm -hmm. and good stories are good stories. <laughs> so whether you have written them for children or for adults, they all have a very similar structure to them. And so then um, even though like even chapter books, like starting with chapter books, they all have the same structure as a novel. It's just kind of harder because they have fewer words. So you don't have any room to mess around. You just got to like get on it, like all the parts mm -hmm. in the thing, right? So um, these are the books that I have that are already out. And here's the weird thing. I am a weirdo. And that <laughs> is actually what makes me uniquely qualified to be able to give this because <laughs> as a weirdo, I have tried a different method of outlining or non outlining for every single one of the books on this screen every single time because I don't know as a weirdo I'm like well I know I'm strange so the way that everybody does things might not be the way that I should do things because um I'm often different from other people and so then it's just given me a lot of um uh, I've had an opportunity to try a lot of different things and so then I can share all of the kinds of different methods that I've tried with you and I'll let you know the things that um make it work make you know that it's working for you or make you know that it's not working for you so most stories have a three act structure this is not a hard rule one of the things that you will learn if you don't already know it <laughs> is that there are no hard rules like absolutely not and if you ask any writer how they wrote their novel they're literally going to tell you something different from every person that you talk to so all you can kind of do is listen to what people are saying, what worked for them, mm -hmm. try some of it. And if, if part of it works for you, keep it. And the part that doesn't work for you, throw it out because writing is fun work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not always highly paid work, which means that it has to be fun work. Like the, <laughs> the joy of it, the good part that you're getting out of it is part of the deal. So if you are not having fun, then you're doing it wrong like something's wrong and it needs to be fixed um that doesn't mean that it's never hard i recently took up over this like pandemic time i took up the ukulele i'm looking over here because there's like a wall of ukuleles to my right <laughs> they're like legit like there's like an actual wall of ukuleles right here oh, fun. um but um it's super hard i'm for almost 44 like the the ukulele is like i feel like i'm like a two-year-old like trying to like place my fingers but even though it's hard and i really really have to concentrate on it when i'm when i'm doing it it's still a lot of fun and writing should be like that maybe it's hard sometimes but it never stops being joyful or fun so when you look at something like what we have on the screen, which is the three act structure, it can look a little bit complex, but I actually promise you that you already know most of it. So give me a second and I'm going to back you up a little bit because a thing that people ask a lot of times is before I outline my novel, like, do I have to be an expert in novels and novel structure? Like, do I have to be, it's like, do I have to be an expert? Well, question, you have lights in your house, probably. Here's a light switch. Do you know exactly how this light switch works? I don't. <laughs> That's how the light switch works. There it is right there. So now I'm giving it to you. Even looking at it, you still might not know how the light switch works. But it kind of doesn't matter because you know how to switch it on and you know how to switch it off and you know when it's not working. Trust me. <laughs> you know for sure when it's not working. So you don't actually need to be an expert in order to be able to do any of these things. You just need to know enough to get by. I always say that it's an operating your cell phone level of knowledge that you need, right? You probably don't know how the inside of your cell phone works, but you know how some of the apps work <laughs> and you can probably use it to make some pretty amazing things. You don't need to understand entirely how the cell phone works in order to be able to use it and get a lot of joy and enjoyment out of it. And that's kind of where we are with uh, outlining the novel. So I'm going to give you some things about what you already know about story. It may feel like you don't know, but these are the things that your teachers, now 
our teachers, and I can say this because I am a teacher and identify as a teacher, um, we've told you some wrong things, right? There's not <laughs> a set way to do it. <laughs> a lot of it is intuitive and you have to be able to trust how you feel when you're going into the situation. So let me give you a little example. When I was in school, my teachers used to always make us write an outline before we wrote an essay. It was the bane of my existence. I hated it. And they would make you like use these little like index cards and they'd be like, you have to put the this part on the this top of the index card and then like the this detail at the bottom of the index card. And it like drove me up a wall because it, it for me, it didn't make sense. It felt tedious and cumbersome. And I was like, I don't want to do this. But then I got hip to the game. And I started writing the essay first and then writing the outline afterwards, <laughs> right? I'd be like, here's the essay. Great. Now, what did I say? And how, like, so that I could, because I, I am a good student, if nothing else. I don't like teachers to be mad at me. So I would just do it in reverse. But it turns out that that's just one of the many different ways so that she's people local? work on things. I think There's she's from the audience. Not one specific way. To she's kind of local. I'm kind of local, not totally local. I mean, oh my gosh, you're a kind of local. <laughs> I am born and raised in New Orleans, and my whole like paternal half of the family is from Vashry, and my maternal half of the family is from Newelton, which is a little too close to Mississippi for comfort. But there we have it. Definitely, um, definitely pretty local. But um, the it's just one of many ways to be able to do it. But all of us have heard so many different stories over the course of our lifetime that part of this we kind of get. And you know it from when you're trying to tell somebody about how somebody cut you off in the line at the grocery store, right? Or when you're trying to tell that story again about the time that your significant other forgot to do X, Y, or Z. <laughs> You know, you, you, you kind of ease them in, <laughs> like here's a little bit of context, <laughs> but then bam, here was the problem and you, your voice starts to get a little stronger and then you get to the point where you're like, no, and this was the worst part. And that, that is either the part where you're expecting everybody to laugh or you're expecting everybody to be like, no, she didn't. I know she did not, <laughs> right? And then after that, you're like, but here was the resolution. Now, the resolution doesn't always mean that things ended up happy, right? Like you might have been upset at the end of that story, but something made it be done, like it's over. Or it might have had a happy ending there. All stories have that structure to it, every single one of them. If it doesn't have that structure, it's not a story. It's something else. It's a chronicle. It's like, it's not a story if it doesn't have those parts to it. So when you're sitting down to write, if you are resisting having those parts, it may just be because what you're writing is not a story and that's okay because stories are not the only kinds of things to write, right? So when you do have a story, then you can come back in here and you're like, okay, this makes a little bit sense, but how do I know what to put in it? Well, this, I, I don't like to read to, to adults. This is not gonna be just audio only for anybody. Is it, Jesse? Wait. No, this is not going to be audio only, right? We're always going to have the visual oh, yes, yes, where this is yes. excellent. Okay. So <laughs> this is from years ago, like years and years ago. This is a Facebook post that I screenshotted like five years ago and I saved it because it was so amazing to me. If you take a look at it, this woman has pretty succinctly <laughs> a, like written out exactly what is supposed to be in every novel right so this is like a little bit long it's a story but a story that's going to end up novel like that's going to have each of these parts so it's all like look there's a problem i don't know it, the problem gets worse oh dang it dang it dang it, dang it right okay <laughs> there's like this there's a little bit language in it but i like redacted the the worst of the language but like right at the end you're like aha i am victorious right here in the end mm -hmm. and i tie everything up but not too neatly because pat endings are, and we'll just say that the last part says not cool. All right. <laughs> not cool at the, at the end. Right. So that's, that's pretty much it there. And if you are reading through it on the screen right now, which I hope you are, you can probably backwards track that to pretty much every TV show season you've ever seen mm -hmm. every movie that you've ever seen. Right. All those things are our story shapes and they're also kind of novel shapes, right? They use the same shape and they use this plan. 
But even when you know this, right? You, even when you know this, when you sit down to write, it may still feel a little bit hard. So it's helpful for you to know before we move on what stage of novel writing you're in. And these are pretty universal and you'll see that the terms that I'm using are fairly a fish. So let's see. Stage one, I have no idea. I don't know where I'm writing. That's good. All right. Uh, stage two, I have an idea. Yeah. Stage three, I have an idea and I kind of know who the story is about. Okay. That main character. Um, I've been writing, but I got stuck. Or the writing is going super slowly and super slowly is as defined by you. Like if you're writing and it feels slow to you, like it feels like you're grinding, then that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about like, I'm not a fast writer. I probably only get um, between 500 and a thousand words every day written, but I write pretty much every day, which means that over the course of a year, I got a lot of words done, but that's because I'm consistent, not because I'm fast, right? Whereas I have friends who write four or 5,000 words a day, no problem, right? <laughs> well, I'm not going to compare my <laughs> slow to their slow, right? Mm -hmm. I would always feel slow for them. So it's really more about how you feel and not like an absolute um, thing there. Okay. And then the next is that you finished the, a draft of a novel. And I say finish a draft of a novel because I've never heard a writer who says that they have made a perfect novel. That's not really a thing. Um, a, a novel that they're not going to keep revising, maybe that's a thing. <laughs> but a novel that they're like, nope, this is perfection. There's not a single thing that I would change. I've never heard that. So we'll just call that last stage. Um, I finished a draft. The lucky charms are there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Each of those stages is perfectly valid. It's like the marshmallow, the, uh, the rainbow marshmallows versus the clover marshmallows. They all taste like marshmallows. They, they're just a thing. It's just, it's just a thing. One of those spots is not better than another spot. It just is where you are. So when you have an idea of where you are, if I, the people that I can see, if you give me a, like a little nod, you don't have to tell me which one you're at. But if you know, then give me a little nod so that I can know I can move forward. Otherwise, I'll keep doing this vamping. There we go. <laughs> so that, um, <laughs> things. Okay. So um, there is um, a, a thing in the writing community that people say, and they try to put people in two camps. They put them in the camp of plotter and they put them in the camp of pantser. And I find this, this graphic hilarious, which is the only reason why I am including <laughs> it here. Um, but uh, the either plotter or pantser, and, and, and that's it. But the fact is that all of us are a little bit of both. And so then I don't actually use that for when I'm trying to figure out what kind of writer people are so that you can figure out what kind of plotting device is going to be most helpful for you. I tend to think of them more like, um, like this. And this actually comes from an article that I read years ago on ReadZ, and it's included in that resource list. Um, it's really old, but it is um, a super useful uh, outlook, I think. So the first category is gardeners. So gardeners are people who like to plant seeds and let them grow. Some people would call those people pantsers. The fact of the matter is that everyone ends up having to outline their novel. Gardeners tend to outline them after they have written a draft, as opposed to outlining them before they've written a draft. That's okay. They like to sit and watch the story grow. They like to feel in the world. They like to know that what's happening is organic. They want the characters to drive what's going on. That is perfect and wonderful. Gardeners, if you want to also be a published novelist and um, uh, if you want to also be a published novelist with someone else publishing your work, because there's also like whole other, we're not even going to get into all that. Um, I have a, a deep love for independent publishing and self-publishing. But when we're talking about like having work that you submit, you're probably going to do some backwards planning on the the, the first draft that you write. So um, sometimes people say when gardeners are writing, they're telling the story to themselves. And then in the next draft, they spend some time figuring out how to tell that story to other people, right? Okay, so that's the first thing. The next category are the architects. And the architects 
plan everything. They know the beginning. They know the end. They know every single scene in, in <laughs> the middle. They know all the orders. They know all of the characters' backstories. They know side characters' backstories. Like, they know every single little thing about it before they're going. Is that a question or an identification, a personal identification? Oh, that's a question. <laughs> yes. It's not like the people, which I can't even fathom, who say, I see a whole movie in my head and then I'm going to write it down. So, <laughs> yes, but yes, those are those people. And um, they are r rare. It's rare that that happens like in their head unless they've been dreaming about it for like a really, really, really long time. But certainly an architect would not just leave it in their head. They would write it down. You're going to see them. It's going to be like the like the police wall where they've got like <laughs> lines and cards and chart, like everything is going to be all like mapped out right in front of them. All right. So then the designers are sort of a blend of the two, right? Designers certainly know everything that's, that's going to happen in a general sense though, right? They're like, I know the story starts here. I know it ends here. I know that that major crisis point, one of those red dots on the map is this, right? But every single detail about what's going on? No, I don't know. Like there's like a little bit more room in there. And knitters are also a different kind of blend of the two. Knitters know just like these, some people call them um, roadmap writers because they just only know major plot points and they have no idea what's going to happen in the middle. But they're like, that's where they're sort of uh, pantsing in between, right? They're like, I don't know. I have no idea how I'm going to get there, but I know that I start here and I end up with a dragon. So let's, <laughs> let's figure out, let's figure out how that happens, but they're figuring it out as they go at the keyboard. An architect could not emotionally stomach figuring that out at the keyboard. <laughs> they would have to know it before they sat down to be able to do it. All right. So thinking, oh, I should have done this first. Thinking about that a little bit, you don't have to share it out loud, although you're welcome to. Which one do you think you probably most fall into naturally? Okay. All right. Now, I, I told you, have tried all of them. <laughs> I actually don't know which one is my most natural style. I can tell you which one was the easiest for me. Um, and I can tell you which one was the most enjoyable for me. And those are two totally different ones, right? So um, the one that was the easiest for me was one where I was the architect. I wrote that book in about three weeks and it like does really, really well. That one is The Little Human. I architected it up. It was amazing. And, but I did not have fun writing it, even though the story is fun. I didn't have as much fun writing it because I already knew every single thing that was going to happen in the story before I wrote it down. So then I wasn't having the same kind of joy of discovery, like, oh my gosh, I see it, you know, like as I was going along. Um, and the one that was the most enjoyable for me was actually a Gardner one, but I'll never write like that again. Um, I spent probably a year and a half on that book. And in order for it to if I were gonna put that book in front of somebody, I would have to do major revisions. And I learned that I do not like to do major revisions, <laughs> <laughs> that I would rather put the book on the side, but that's me, right? Everyone has to decide who they are. I know lots of friends, including um, my friend, Tracy Batiste. She writes almost all of the drafts of her book. There went the light, so I probably am different. Uh, I don't even know, it just like kind of fell down. We'll leave it there. Um, so um, my friend Tracy Batiste, who um, wrote the Jumbies books, and like she's written a bunch of other books too, but um, she writes almost all of her first drafts within three weeks. But then she spends a couple of months revising her first draft. That's her best process, right? Like there's no, there's no right. What's right is what feels smooth to you, what feels good to you, what brings you joy, and also gets you finished in the end. If you are doing a thing that gives you joy and you really actually want to finish a book because I am not a, 
like I'm, I do not subscribe to the belief that you have to, right? Like I think that you should write for joy. So I think that if you are having fun and you are getting something out of your writing, that it doesn't necessarily have to result in a finished book or like a published piece. Like that's not the pinnacle of it. But if that's one of your goals, then if you are trying to finish and you're unable to finish with the method that you're doing, you probably want to try a little something else. So now we get to the tools. Different tools are going to work better for different kinds of writers. That's why we were kind of thinking about that ahead of time. So for people who are gardeners, people who like to just kind of live in the story and see where it goes and eventually you'll get to the end and you maybe have 600 pages of <laughs> cool writing, some of it disjointed, some of it not, like some of it together. Um, you're going to do a backwards planning process. And all of these things that are on the screen here are great tools that I have literally used for backwards planning processes. I just caveat, I've used all these tools. I'm sure that there are even better tools out there somewhere. There always are, right? <laughs> but I don't want to recommend you things that I haven't actually used myself. So everything that I've put that I will show you are things that I've used. And the ones that I used that didn't work at all, I'm just not sharing them. It's like when people say, oh, this one got a negative review from me. I don't give negative reviews. I'm just not going to talk about it. <laughs> so then all of these are good right? <laughs> and I've used them all, but they will suit different people a little bit better. So um, uh, the story grid, the story grid is um, written by an editor who was an editor in the industry for like 20, 20 plus years. And this is the tool that he used with his writers. When they would submit a manuscript to him, he would read it and he would map it onto this extremely extensive grid that tells you all of the plot point, all of the points that are supposed to be in a story and at what spot they're supposed to be in the story so he would read that he has like a spreadsheet you can download the spreadsheet there's like a link to it in the book if you get the book um where uh there's a spreadsheet and it will tell you like this spot is happening here but it was supposed to happen way back here so then you can look at it and be like okay these are the spots that i need to adjust like this is where i need to add more or take more away if you love spreadsheets like this is your joint right here <laughs> you have a draft and you love a spreadsheet this is you if you're not a spreadsheet lover there's something else over here for you as well right um there is a a book called save the cat now save the cat is actually a book about screenwriting but Save the Cat, the book about screenwriting, is really just about story and stories that are shaped like a novel. So, so many novelists that I know who are hugely successful use Save the Cat as their, um, either their editing thing or their starting point to be able to, to write. It essentially uses these 15 beats, i.e. main things that need to happen in the story. And... Uh, it tells you at what point they're supposed to happen in the story. Well, if you have a manuscript that's already written out and you go to read the original Save the Cat, you're probably going to beat your head against a wall because he's a little obtuse. He does a little name dropping. Like it's not always directly to the point, but there is this woman whose name is Jessica Brody, whom um, I got to interview on a podcast. She's really smart very very smart and um she was like hey you guys i was not selling books and then i started using this method and now i am selling books and also have two movie deals like coming so maybe you want to like pay attention to this thing so i took a look at the book and it's brilliant what she did is she read save the cat this is all with permission of the 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 of um, Blake Snyder's estate. So she read Save the Cat and she essentially translated it for people who write novels. Not change, you know, translate it <laughs> to make it easier for novelists. So when a person has a novel already written out, um, if they're not a spreadsheet person, I tell them, get Save the Cat writes a novel. Read Save the Cat writes a novel. You don't have to read it entirely in order. Like you'll see when you're, when you're getting in there, each of the sections stands alone. And it, depending on which kind of story you're writing, 
you it's almost like a choose your own adventure like you can follow the path inside of the book for the kind of story that you want to write and she will break down all of those points that are supposed to be in the story where they are how they're supposed to go and so you can compare that to the manuscript that you have the one that you've let lovingly grow on its own wild in the garden <laughs> and use it to figure out which parts you prune and which parts you keep so those are great tools again the, these are all listed on the resource page so you don't have to like write them all down all right next knitters and designers okay so again save the cat is really great for knitters and designers because if you are sitting down and you want to have an idea of what you're going to write before you write it it's a great tool for being able to come up with big stopping points along the way same thing for save the cat writes a novel another um writer friend of mine who's also a teacher of writing whose name is scott king has he actually has a series about writing novels and screenplays this is just one of them that is super useful called story pitch and in it you figure out how to take a pitch that you would use for an editor or an agent and uh so like make a really pithy pitch and then slowly expand it into what would be your full fledged novel. It's a perfect walkthrough. It's almost like a workbook. So that is really good if you are wanting to have some plot points, but not like every single scene necessarily as you go along. And then the one that's maybe, I think the most obscure, it's like the one that people recognize least when I talk about this, is the snowflake method. Have any of you heard of the snowflake method? No. Aaron, I think Aaron maybe has, but like uh, other people have not. Well, I, if, I, if I'm saying something wrong, Aaron, because, you know, I try, but I'm not a perfect person. <laughs> so <laughs> correct me, jump in and correct me. The snowflake method is similar to um, Scott's method of like taking a pitch for a story and, and going forward, except that it, 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 it doesn't use the tool of it being a pitch necessarily, right? It um, starts you off really simply. And I'm just checking the time to make sure we have time to do this and we do. So we're gonna do this just super quickly together. Mm -hmm. um, just the first step of the snowflake method, right? So the first step of the snowflake method, we're not gonna do the whole thing. I'm gonna tell you about it. You're gonna imagine that you're doing it. We're gonna keep it going from there. But um, the first step is take an hour and write a one sentence summary of your novel. If you already have an, a novel, that's gonna be super hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> to boil it down to the one sentence. If you don't, if you're a knitter or a designer and you're about to sit down to write a novel, this is super, super useful, right? So this is the tool that I used to write The Little Human. Again, fastest novel that I've ever written. So it takes you from one sentence, right? That you're like, okay. But in order to do that one sentence, the one sentence should, will be really specific and it needs to be really short right? So then um, it, it's going to end up having this structure, right? Um, a rogue physicist travels back in time to kill the Apostle Paul. Okay. So um, it has a few things in it, right? It tells you who the main character is. It tells you what the big conflict of the story is. And it tells you what the hooky ness of it is, right? Like what's the thing that's going to drag readers in? But it's also really short and to the point so then if you have that one sentence and you stick that one sentence up to the corner of your computer screen or in the corner of your notebook as you're writing forward you're not going to stray <laughs> and it's going to go it's going to go um really quickly so then after you've got the one sentence the next step is that um it guides you into turning your one sentence into a few sentences and then your few sentences into a paragraph and then your paragraph into a structured summary. And out of the structured summary, essentially what you end up having is the 15 beats that were on that other sheet altogether, but it's like a different way of being able to get there. So if you're a knitter, the possibility that you are a global to linear thinker, right? Where you've got like big ideas and maybe a starting point, but not the whole thing. Like that helps you go from, I have this big idea to 
okay, and this is how the big idea plays out. So like, that's super useful. Again, there's a link. That one's like totally free. Nobody's even selling it. It's weird. Um, that one's totally free. It's online. It works. It works really well. If you like um, knitting and designing, if you're a planner to an extent. And with the um, snowflake method, and with a couple of others, you'll see that they repeat because if you are an architect, you can pretty much take any of the ones that we've talked about and just take it all the way. Like just keep going all the way. And if you're an architect, you won't be able to help yourself. Like you're going to keep going, right? Until you've got all of those things ahead of time. So um, the ones that I do not recommend for people who are not architects because you'll fall down a rabbit hole maybe <laughs> and maybe not climb out of it again are these ones that I absolutely adore and definitely read myself and reread over and over again. So see how that's like advice, but also anti-advice. Story by Robert McKee, who is also a screenwriter and Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And there are like screen covers on here, but um, the screen cover of a hero with a, the hero with a thousand faces, that book has probably had 15 different covers over the years. So just over the years, so just take a look at it. It is, um, the hero's journey, right? Um, and so then if you've ever watched, um, uh, Star Wars, A New Hope, it's l almost word for word, the hero's journey that's in, um, the hero with a thousand faces, but so is, so are so many other stories that, you know, you can do it too. <laughs> You'll just use different characters. It'll be fine. Right. But it's a deep dive. Like it's not um, very light and it's not written as a how to guide. It's written more like um, you want to become a deep expert in story. Here we go. Right. And same <laughs> thing for Robert McKee's story. He's a screenwriter. Um, and, uh, but same thing, the principles carry forward. Um, one thing that Robert McKee does really, first of all, Robert McKee has a workshop that I think costs some ridiculous amount of money to attend. And that's wonderful. If you love workshops and you also have cash to be able to attend, um, that workshop, then like rock on. Right. But story by Robert McKee is like 20 bucks. And I think that every single thing he says in that workshop is in the book. So like, if you're willing to, to read the book, you could get like a $15,000 workshop value for, for 20 bucks or for free if you check it out from your local library. So, yes, you, so you've got that going on. You're like, yes, do the circulation. <laughs> so, so, so um, there's that. But in addition to that, there is um, a podcast. So there are two of his mentees Robert McKee's mentees who do a podcast. And I super recommend this podcast for people who actually want to have um, that architect's view of story. Um, they don't break down books. And it's the smartest thing ever for people who are writing novels to not have them break down books. Because if you've never seen the show or the movie that they're talking about, in, in an episode, they break down, in every episode, they break down uh, either a movie or uh, an episode of a television show in terms of story and all the story parts. So, like, you're becoming more expert with, every, with everyone. However, unlike a novel that you've never read where and somebody's, like, going on and on with you about the novel and, like, all the parts of the novel, if you've never read it, you've got to have, like, a much more significant time investment in order to be able to follow along or whatever, whatever. Some of these were like, you know, the, the, the source material was half an hour. So I'd be like, okay, <laughs> let me go find the show on Netflix and watch it <laughs> half an hour. And then I'll listen to the episode of podcast. And I learned so much that way. So that, th that's true um, for that one. And um, the last one that's on this page is Story Genius. And Story Genius is similar to um, Story Pitch and it's also some, it's like a cross between story pitch and save the cat writes a novel. It's also has all the parts in it, but it is definitely structured like a workbook. It's like having your mentor sit next to you and talk to you each step of the way. It's like, okay, first you're supposed to think about this. Now stop and think about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> did you write it down? Okay. You did. 
okay, now come back and you can read the next part of it and keep going. So it really is very, very, very step-by-step. -step. If you um, want to know every single little piece of what's going to be in the book before you sit down to write it, then Story Genius is um, a really great place for you to be able to, to get all of those pieces and to have them be clear and easy to follow along with over years, really. Like you can keep going back and back and back to the same book. However, if you're the kind of person who could spend eight years outlining and maybe never getting to the part where you write, then I would recommend staying away from every single thing on <laughs> this page um, because it's totally a rabbit hole. Like it's, there's so much information. It's so interesting. You could get so deep into analyzing story that you never end up writing any story of your own. So if you want to, um, if you like that kind of thing, give it a little taste, but like, you know, maybe set a timer for yourself. Like, don't, don't let it, don't let it get too deep if you actually want to be able to get some, uh, some writing in there. Okay. So now I th think we have a little bit of time for questions, but if we don't have questions, then I would love to explain to you about how I used each of the methods, um, for the different novels that I wrote. So we have choices there. There we go. All right. So I think we're good. So, and I think we still have a couple of minutes, don't we, Jesse? Yeah, I think yes, we do. Yes, yes, no, we're okay. good. Okay. So um, the snowflake method I told you was for me, the, it was the one that I used to write The Little Human, which is a story about a little girl who longs to swim in the sea, but ends up with more than she bargains with. And I can say that sentence so easily and have said it 1000 times because it is the first sentence <laughs> that I wrote as a part of the snowflake method thing. Right. So then I was super, it was super easy to pitch it. I never, never, never veered off track when I was writing the story. Like it was so easy to write. Now that's not to say that I got, but it wasn't as much fun. That's not to say that I didn't have fun. I had a ton of fun in the literal three hours that it took me to plot the thing. I lived a whole life in those three hours. <laughs> it was intense. It was great. Those three hours. But then in the time that I spent writing, I was like, oh, I saw this already. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, I knew this already. Right. <laughs> so for me, that was like less, it was less, that part was less fun, but I had so much fun in the actual outlining part. My friend, Rebecca, loves outlining. She'll outline 15 different stories, but like she doesn't end up finishing them. So we've had to sort of ban her from the snowflake method because <laughs> she gets all the enjoyment in the, <laughs> in the thing. And then she doesn't finish writing the project. So we're like, you keep saying you want to finish the novel. So you've got to abandon uh, that method in there. Okay. Um, Jupiter storm entirely grew. I sat down at my friend's dining room table. She's a writer and she often will have other writers over to just quietly co-work, right? Where everybody's just kind of sitting, drinking their respective tea, kombucha, water, whatever. Everybody's just like <laughs> drinking something different around the table and sitting quietly. And at that table, I knew that I wanted to write a story about a dragon. That, by the way, is not enough to be an idea. That's <laughs> That's not, that's not even an idea. That's like a vague notion right, of, of what's happening. And it slowly, slowly, slowly grew at the table. I was thinking, well, I know I want to write about dragons. That makes me think a lot of Puff the Magic Dragon. And in that song version there and also in like the cartoon version there's little Jackie paper but like I wouldn't want to do just like a spin-off of this thing so like how would that work and then like if there's going to be dragons in our world like who could possibly be a person who would be able to like be smart enough to notice them but like also not noticeable enough for people to notice that she has a dragon. And then sitting at that dining room table, I was like, oh, my mother. <laughs> 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 and so I started sitting and imagining what it would be like at that table um, 
for if my mother had discovered something that could grow a dragon. So like that's as much that's 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 where I was thinking right in the beginning. But that's still no plot, no story. This is just where is this gonna take me? Um, it took me, and that first book, I really had to like sit and imagine and uh, work through. And then I had to edit a lot <laughs> in order <laughs> to be able to make it be um, one cohesive storyline. And I super, super do not like <laughs> um, doing strong revisions. But that story is such a story of my heart that I couldn't not do the revisions. Another book that's not on this list because I'm just not going to do them is one that is about uh, one that I finished that I'm not going to revise again about um, a girl who finds out that she's a fairy. Great. Awesome. Awesome sauce. So much fun stuff in the thing. But I also let that story slight slowly blossom. It blossomed into about 120,000 words. I don't even want to mess with that one again. <laughs> like, I'm just like, you know what? It was done. It's a lesson learned. I learned from it, but I don't, I don't want to do a major revision on that one. So then it will just kind of sit on the side. Now, on the other hand, the Jayla and the Wolves that's on here, also super, super tight. But for this one, I actually used the uh, Save the Cat, the original save the cat beats and I so I just knew those 15 beats before I sat down to to write the the book and it also flowed pretty quickly it actually felt more fun to write than when I had done the one with the snowflake method because I really had had to figure out how everything was interconnected as a part of the snowflake method so then I really imagined the whole thing whereas this uh with the save the cat beats I kind of picked the spots, but then I could imagine in the in-betweens of the spots. However, there is one book that is not on this list, and it's a book that um, I just recently um, got a six-figure deal for, and it um, is called, wait, they changed the title. I'm going to say the wrong thing. The Wild Seed Witch. It's called The Wild <laughs> Seed Witch, and um, uh, that one is straight up Save the Cat Writes a Novel. In fact... I wrote it to see if it, if I could follow Save the Cat Writes a Novel. <laughs> so I don't know <laughs> if that's a, if that's a goal of yours, then being able to stick to um, like, they're very, it's very traditional beats. And for some people they're like, this feels formulaic. But the thing is that as original as we all feel like we are, we're not. Because story is a thing. It has a structure. It's like somebody saying they can literally put anything in a pot and have it be gumbo. That's a lie. You can put a lot of stuff in a pot. And yes, the idea of gumbo is that it was a lot of stuff that was left over in the refrigerator that you could put together and make a thing. But just putting stuff together in a pot does not make it gumbo. Like there's a structure to it. Like there's a thing that we know that we will recognize in the end as gumbo, even if you only put chicken and sausage in it in yours, but then somebody else only put seafood in it. You recognize both of those things as gumbo because of the structure that's around it, okay? Same thing for story. So when you are looking at something that's super structured, like Save the Cat Writes a Novel, some people are like, oh, it's like not artistic because there's structure. False. <laughs> it will actually be easier to recognize as the art form that you want it to be recognized as because of the structure just like making sure that you get that root dark enough when you are making mm -hmm. your gumbo all right so um i think i hit all the things oh the jade and tucson books oh actually each one of those also was a different one the first one was um i used the uh one, another one that's on the list but that's not on this thing which is the magic words by cheryl klein it's on the the resource guide um, but then I realized for the second one that it really is novel shaped. I was like, oh no, these are novel shaped. So then I went back to my like regular feeling of like, okay, I need to hit all of the novel beats with this one. And so then Scott King's book um, was like his, his structure was really super helpful for both the second and the third one of those series. And then the cool thing about chapter book series is that once you have done something three times, 
the readers will not let you do something different. So then for books four and five <laughs> in that series, I really had to just go back and backwards map those, the first three, to make sure that we were getting all the same elements in the other three, because I promise you that I would get letters from children being like, there was no dance party. Oh. <laughs> like, it, you know, like there would be a thing. I don't, I don't want to get those letters. <laughs> I'm like, we, so we got those. Back. Okay. So now, um, do you guys have any questions for me? I think there was a question in the chat mm -hmm. on the name of the podcast from Aaron. Great. So the name of the podcast for um, the Robert McKee, the, the story podcast is called the Story Toolkit. And it is on that resource guide. And also there is um, super interesting, a podcast that's also on the, the thing on the, the resource guide that is called the Story Grid podcast, which obviously goes with the Story Grid. Um, and what's super interesting is that there's this guy who was like, he wanted to write a novel. And so he approached the author of the story grid and said, hey, would you be on this podcast with me? It'll probably boost sales of your book. <laughs> And on the podcast, I'll write my novel and you'll just critique me every week based on the story grid, right? Well, he did, right? It was a disaster. It was a total disaster because the guy was trying to write his novel from the beginning using a tool that's really meant for after your manuscript is already written. So he wrote this whole thing getting critiqued week by week. You can listen to it. It's great. Like you totally <laughs> should. <laughs> um, getting critiqued week by week. And at the end of it, the, um, the author was like, well, you know, this is how this process works. So now <laughs> we'll go back and look at it and, and we'll make it like, no, you made like a little Frankenstein <laughs> with like all these like pieces, parts attached to each other that were sort of alive. Like it didn't work. But it was, it's great because it is a great tool, but it, that's not the way that it's meant to be used. So um, they did a little bit differently the next time around. And so that you'll, you'll be able to see that as you're listening through the podcast. And obviously podcasts are free. Um, and also a thing that you can listen to in the background while you're doing something else, which I actually find to be super useful when you're trying to plan your own story. If you sit down with a pen and paper at the table and you're like, now I'm going to be creative. Sometimes that backfires on you. Sometimes it works better if you were gonna go out for a walk anyway, right? And yeah. while you're out for a walk, instead of having the paper copy of Save the Cat Writes, the no Writes a Novel, you have the audiobook copy, mm. right? Mm. And you're just listening to it and letting it wash over you. And then you're like, oh, wait, click, click, click. And pieces of your story maybe start to click together. Same thing for any of the podcasts or whatever. Um, sometimes take your mind off it a little bit before you, uh, in order to give yourself the freedom to be creative in that thing. I was going to ask, was there any difference in plotting? Because you said Jupiter Storm was a trilogy. It, it is. Did you know that from the beginning? So I didn't know it from the like from day one sitting at that dining room table. But by the time I was maybe a third of the way into it, like, and my brain was going forward about what the story would be, I was like, oh, snap, I'm not going to be able for this age group. I'm not going to be able to write a book long enough to get from where I am starting, where I want us to start, right? So that it feels real <laughs> um, all the way to where I where I wanted to end, which is really far out. <laughs> so um, I was like, I'm gonna, it's gonna have to be a trilogy. I will tell you that um, I, like it was the dumbest thing that I've ever done. It has been so hard. Um, I thought it would be super easy because I knew where it was going, but writing the end and knowing how many stories I've read that I was like, oh, the author forgot this thread, the author forgot that thread, or like this little piece was dropped. I, and I'm like obsessing about it. It's making writing the ending so hard because like I'm spending half the time going back and like rereading and refinding things from like the, um, from the second book to make sure that I'm not leaving anything out. But mm -hmm. yes, I did know that it would end up being, um, that it would end up being three before I finished writing the first one, well before I finished writing the first one. Um, 
but uh but not from like day one i didn't sit down to say oh i gotta write a trilogy let's do this <laughs> Well, I just want to say thank you to Marty because this was absolutely amazing. You're amazing. Uh, Aw, so, you're sweet. Yeah, so much great information. Um, I'm sure, like, I mean, I know I got a lot out of it. I'm sure everyone else did, too. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't I will, know. Oh. I super, super, super encourage you to look at that resource guide. Not every not every single book on the resource guide, but um, this kind of like, if you were doing a workshop um, or workshopping your novel where you were gonna outline in person, we would literally spend a weekend doing it, right? Where we would have mm -hmm. like probably like 12, 16 hours over the course of a, of a weekend to do it. So um, this is the next best thing where it's like, here's the, <laughs> here are resources that you can use. I promise you that they work. You won't have to go fishing through the bad ones. <laughs> here are some good ones that for sure work, but make sure that you pick the ones that match your style. <laughs> we had a comment from Tammy said she loved this. Thank you oh, so that's much. Sweet. That's awesome to hear. We, uh, I appreciate everyone who tuned in today. I think that was amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, I love to say tough cool audience. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm so happy that everyone enjoyed it. And again, just thank you all for tuning in. I don't know if there's any more last minute questions before we go ahead and log off or, or anything like that. <laughs> no? Okay, then I guess I guess we're uh, we're we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, yeah, coming up on seven o'clock. So uh, yeah, just again, thank you, Marty. Thank you everyone for tuning in, and I will hopefully be able to upload this to our YouTube channel, and I will hopefully see you guys at our next Zoom session. <laughs> so, yay! Thanks for having me. It was of fun. Course, anytime. We love you. We love Marty. <laughs> oh yay! Because I love you guys too. It's oh, great. good. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll uh, yep, and see you all later. Bye. Uh, thank you. Thank you.